Welcome to the Steady On Podcast, where God's hard truth meets your hard story. I don't need to tell you that life gets hard. Life gets hard, really hard. But God's faithfulness is still active and alive in our hard. And these episodes are dedicated to remembering and claiming the promises of a faithful God. I'm your host, Angie Bauman. I'm a pastor and Bible teacher, founder of Steady On Ministries, and creator of the Step-by-Step Bible Study Method. But more than that, I'm a trauma and abuse survivor who carried a heavy weight of shame and worthlessness for many years, and I still struggle, but I live in much more freedom now because I know God through His Word and speak truth to the lies of the enemy with His Word. And that's what we do here. On Mondays, we take it in by studying the promises of God, And on Wednesdays, we live it out with teaching and testimony on the promises of God. So thank you for tuning in, my friend. You are the reason for this show, and I'm so very, very glad you are here. Let's get started. Hey, friend, thank you for inviting me into your day. I hope you love this episode with author and podcaster Sarah Klein. Sarah's son, TJ, has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a terminal diagnosis he's been living with for about 11 years. And Sarah set to talk with me about parenting a child with special needs and what we can do to listen to and support others who are walking that road. Our verse this week is 2 Corinthians 4, 8. Hear it in God's word translation. I love this. It says, in every way we're troubled, but we aren't crushed by our troubles. We're frustrated, but we don't give up. Not only has Sarah not given up, she has allowed God to draw her close to him, strengthen her faith, and infuse her with purpose and peace. It's a struggle, of course it is, but it was an absolute privilege to share space with this woman who has resolutely decided, I will trust the Lord. Let's listen in. Sarah, welcome to the Steady On community. So good to have you here today. Thanks for having me. I am excited to talk to you about this. Just to start us off with a little backstory, why is this something that you're just really passionate about? Well, in 2012, my youngest son, TJ, who was eight at the time, we I actually worked for an orthopedist and we put him in physical therapy because he just wasn't walking up the stairs correctly. And he had kind of an awkward gait. We just thought we would uh, fix that. And... I fielded a phone call, uh, just happened to answer the phone at the clinic, and um, they had a concern over a patient that was referred to them, and it happened to be my son, and they wouldn't speak to me about it, and fast forward a little bit, and it ended up that my son was diagnosed with a an aggressive and progressive terminal form of muscular dystrophy called Duchenne, and so the next six months... And actually the next couple of years were just a fog for us. And here we had this, what we thought was just, just kind of an awkward walk (laughs) that we were going to fix. And then all of a sudden we were told, well, you have a Duchenne boy, Uh, take him home and love him. We'll see you in about six months. And there's really nothing you can do. Um, He will have an average life expectancy of 23 and by the age of 12, he'll most likely be in a wheelchair. Every muscle in the body will shut down, including the heart and lungs, and he'll eventually stop walking. He'll not be able to sit up on his own, won't be able to use his arms, won't be able to feed himself, eventually not be able to eat on his own. It was just, but here's a free camp (laughs) and take him home and love him. And that just wasn't good enough for my husband and I, we just, that wasn't good enough. And I was raised in the church. My husband was not, he did not find, um, he did not find his faith. He did not find the Lord until we ended up meeting and, um, getting married. And he was baptized at the age of 26 and he took it a lot better than I did. As far as faith was concerned, he immediately just knew that God was going to take care of it. I never doubted that there was a God. I doubted, I doubted the type of God he was at that moment. And I, my faith was really tested in a way that it never had been tested before. I think I just, I was raised Christian and I think I just took it for granted my entire life that this is just what I was raised with. My whole family was Christian and it just was, 
the sky is blue and I am Christian. And that was how it just is. And I was really angry for a long time. And I yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, yeah, finish no. your thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think I, I love what you're saying already because I think this happens to us so much. It mm -hmm. happens to us so often at the time where we have, you're dealing with your son's health crisis. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you're dealing with your own faith crisis, right? Mm -hmm. So you have these two things that are going on at the same time. So I kind of want to talk mm -hmm. about both of those things. Um, fast forward in the story just a little bit, because we're all very interested in, in what has happened to TJ. Well, he is actually, he is 19 and he is unbelievably just, uh, he's still walking. He is just the happiest, happiest and most energetic young man that uh, he just has a heart about him. Mm -hmm. And we learned very early on that he has a, he might have a terminal diagnosis, um, but it was going to be at the age of eight, like every child, they're going to mimic their parents. They're going to mimic who is around them and is molding them. And like I said, I, I had a crisis of faith and it all went together. His, his health, his mental health, his physical health, and his spiritual health was all intertwined. And I didn't know it at the time, but he was looking to me to see where, how I was handling it. Wow. And it was early on in this journey that I realized I was turning this terminal diagnosis into a terminal life for him. And that wasn't acceptable. So I could make whatever time he had on this earth worthwhile, or I could spend whatever time he had left being angry and I finally just decided I needed to decide whether or not my faith was fluff or if it actually was foundational. And I am, I am a just, I'm a big nerd. <laughs> I am a self-proclaimed geek and I am very proud of it. I, uh, I, I am now a speaker and a podcaster and a writer, but I actually, well, I'm a mathematician and a statistician by trade. <laughs> That's what I went to school with. So uh, um, you're welcome, mom. All of that money at college is well worth it, I guess. Um, but I just, I thought, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to dive in. And if the, the God that I believed in doesn't want little minions running around, because that's what I was told growing up. And he wants me to truly believe in him and follow him with my own truth and my own judgment and my own knowledge that I'm going to really dive into this. And I did, I dove in and I, I, I studied it in my true nerdy self. And what I kept finding was more truth. And, and I actually cemented my faith more than I ever could. And it was one, one particular moment when it was, an ugly cry in a closet. And I can't tell this part of the story without crying. Um, you would think after 11 years, it was, yeah. it would be easier, but um, it's, it's a beautiful part, but it's also still this part that I know God, um, I, I know he loves this part and I know he does not shame me for it, but I was like, how can you, give this boy to me and take him away. And it was this ugly, ugly cry. Any, any mom, yes. any woman, any person who has ever just not known what to do in a moment. <laughs> we all know that ugly cry, that ugly cry on your own. And I was just, I was in this closet on my own um, behind three closed doors. Cause nobody, nobody needed to see me cry like that. And I just thought, how could you do this? How could you give me this perfect boy and take him away? How dare you? And I actually even had this, like, it's, what are, are you a puppet master? Do you have fun? Is this fun for you? I, I was really mean. I was, I said things that never should have said to a creator that loves us this much. And, and all I know is a loving God sat there with me and said, I know what it's like to lose a child. I know what that's like. 
And not once did I feel, feel that judgment. I just felt a love. And it was really at that moment that I felt the love that I was always told that he had for us. And it was like, find your truth, find the truth that I have said, and don't accept it, find it. And that's what I did. I just kept, I just kept learning and I did. And it was, there's nothing in my mathematician, statistician mind that every one plus one always equals two. There is never a gray area with me in my whole life. There's nothing everybody can tell me. Nobody can ever take this truth from me. I know it without a doubt in my mind. So, and that's what my son's diagnosis has done. It is not only just saved, it saved me. And I know it saved him in this. It, it has brought so much to our life in the past 11 years um, it's hard, but it's hard in a, in a way that I can't even begin to articulate, I think. <laughs> yes. I, thank you so much for sharing, uh, mm -hmm. that very precious moment where God was so real to you in your closet. I have been there. I'm sure <laughs> the listeners are nodding going, Oh yes, I know that. I know that cry. I know that closet. Um, but here's what I hear in that too, is that you said something really powerful that you had a decision to make. I won't say it as well. You did about whether this was a terminal diagnosis or a terminal life. And I hear what happened to you in that closet is like, this is how you make that choice, right? Of how mm -hmm. your son is watching. And he is, I think that's, that is really powerful. My child is going to watch how I do this and take in a lot of ways, my, his cues from me. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful that you shared that experience in the closet because that I know that's God. God knows we have those questions, those feelings, that hatefulness, that blaming, all of that. And that is the best place to take it is right back to him because otherwise we'll, we'll do, we'll put it on our people and we'll, you know, uh, negative behaviors or resentment, or I don't know. I mean, you know, so many things that right. we can do with it. And he just, he wants us to bring those questions to him. I believe that with all my heart and no, he will not shame us. He will hold us close even while we're kicking and screaming. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So I just really appreciate you sharing that. And I think one of the reasons it moves me so much is that's where we make those decisions of I'm digging in, in terms of my faith or I'm running away. And yeah. yeah. And I, I think anybody listening to, I would like to point out that I said that I grew up Christian and I've been Christian my whole life, but there's, there was a five, six year period where I, I was not, I did not a attend church regularly. I went to college. I did my thing. I made poor choices. So it's, you know, God could have sat there in that closet with me and said, well, Sarah, you haven't been the best Christian. Why am I doing this? You could have been praying more. You could have been attending church more regularly. You have not been in your Bible every day. You have not prayed regularly. You don't pray before every meal. You don't pray before you go to bed. I mean, he could have said all of these things. I'm sitting here thinking, why are you doing this to me? I've been this mediocre Christian my whole life. I mean, really when it comes down to it, but he didn't do that. He just really helped me and just said, I know, I know. And I think that's what my takeaway was. There was no shaming. There was no, it was, okay, let's find your truth. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think one of the things you're really talking about is when God like doesn't meet our expectations, right? Like mm -hmm. this is what I thought I had this beautiful child, or I had mm -hmm. this beautiful life, or I had this job, or I had this marriage, or I had this financial security, right? You And now I don't have it and I do not understand. And so how have you learned to like cling to God and walk closely with him in the midst of sort of that uh, scattering of unmet expectations, maybe? I, I have learned, I think as you get older and Hindsight's always 2020. 20. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it really is. But I think now I it's can. It's always a better story to tell when we're on the other side of the I things, know. Right? Yeah. Let me I clean, know. Let me clean I up know. this, even the messy cry. The I know. Cry. Let's just clean this up a little bit. Yeah. I, I know. know. I know. I know. Yeah. But that's okay, it's, though. We can learn from is. that. Yes. It yes. is. And anybody who is in the beginning of their journey is going to be like, oh, here we go. Somebody's yeah. 10 years into it and is going to tell me that it's going to be okay. But and it doesn't help when you're in the moment because mm -hmm. I still have those moments now mm -hmm. where I fear 
the day that I won't have my son. Sure. There's still fear. So it's not like, I still know that I'm going to have those moments. Um, but you know, I have people tell me a oh, one day it's going to get better and, or it's going to get, it might not be easier, but you're going to get more used to it, I guess the diagnosis. But I think the way that I cling to it is I just know without a shadow of a doubt that God's going to get me through it. If he's gotten me this far, I see I had dreams for my son that I realize now were my dreams. They were not my son's reality. And I had these dreams that he was maybe going to play soccer or he was going to do this. We're a big soccer family. My husband coaches, my oldest son played college, you know, he, he played in high school and he played a little bit in college and, um, and my youngest son I thought was going to play too. That was just the dream. And if he didn't, that was fine, but that was really what, I mean, really that was what it was going to do. And instead he's been the team manager and I've seen the I've seen the lives that he's touched just by being who he is and just the quiet strength that he's had. And I've seen lives that he's changed in ways that he would never have been able to do without this diagnosis. And I think, I thank God every day that I don't have to make the choice of taking the diagnosis away because I do think sometimes I'm selfish enough that I would make the easier choice. But I know that this hard road that we are on is making a kingdom difference. And I don't have, God's the one making the difference the difficult choices. He's the one that's making those big changes, those big differences. And I am just on this journey and I just get to be a part of my son's life. And I cling to that in ways that I, ha I remember that God loves my son. God loves TJ more than I could ever imagine and more than I could ever love TJ. And Whatever I had planned for TJ doesn't compare to the eternal difference and the eternal plan that God has. And I just have to keep that in mind. And what I knew 10 years ago doesn't compare to the joy that we have right now. And that's just, it's, it's really a daily choice. It really is a daily choice that I have to make. And some days it's easier. Some days it's harder. Right. I appreciate that too. Yeah. I will. I'm so moved by the peace in your voice and just that standing on this is true. And I like, this is TJ's life. This mm -hmm. is his life. And this is the way that God is calling him to partner with him in kingdom work and you and your whole family mm -hmm. to partner him with him because this is his life. And it's not at all what I expected, not what I wanted, not what I would have chosen. And yet we do have this choice of, we can see God at work in it. Or we can just be mad, whatever the, it is, right? We can just be mad that it's not what we wanted. And we can not see what's so plainly in front of us that God is actively at work in this story. And right. that's beautiful, Sarah. It really is. It's so solid. And I know, I know there are moments where you don't feel so solid. Thank you for saying that too. But it, but I hear it in you. I hear you like, this is what I know. And when it gets slippery, <laughs> and I'm sure it does sometimes, <laughs> right? When it gets slippery, when it gets hard, when something doesn't go right, when the, when the diagnosis and the illness is leading us in some way, right? Mm -hmm. You know, something new happens. It's always the new thing that you're like, wait a second. No, no. I, I always say, I'm like, I punched my card. We don't need anything <laughs> new, right? Like this, um, I'm sure there are moments like that. And yet you're so solid in this uh, trust in a faithful God. And that, yeah. that moves me. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I think it's important too, that in some way, every day I take a moment with God. Mm. And I think, again, this is my type A this is my math personality that I am very much where I used to be. Okay. If I'm going to be real, if I'm going to be a good Christian girl, I need to spend my 30 minutes in the Bible. I need to get up and I need to do that. Well, that that's just not the reality of my life. My son's going to have an episode in the middle of the night. I'm going to 
be tired. I'm not going to get up and do 30 minutes. I mean, it just doesn't work for our lives. It's just not, it's just not going to happen. It doesn't work for most lives. I mean, it's just not, it's just not there. Um, so it's not an all or nothing relationship with God. It's not an all or relationship with my husband. It's not an all or nothing relationship with my mom or my sister. So if I can't spend some time with my sister on the phone every week, that doesn't mean that we just give up on a relationship. It it's, and that's the same as with God. So sometimes it is just taking a moment, turning off the, turning off the, the radio or not streaming music in my, in my, on my van on after I drop my son off somewhere and just taking a moment to breathe and know that God's with me and just setting a moment, just taking a moment in his present yeah, yeah. in his presence, or just taking a walk outside and just thanking God for that. And sometimes it is God, I am struggling today. The fear is too much. I know there's appointments coming up next week. We are getting closer and closer to his life expectancy date. It's like a neon sign and it is too much. I can't find. Yeah, yeah. I can't. I, I don't think I can handle it today. I need you to handle it for me. And sometimes that's all I can do in his presence yeah. and that's okay. Yeah. And so, you know, like that, that piece that you hear, sometimes that's not my piece, that's his. And so that's all I can do sometimes. Um, but it's some form or fashion being in his presence. Yeah. And that is sometimes it's a little begrudgingly. Um, and sometimes I don't want to be sometimes that anger or, jealousy of other parents that don't have to deal with this, it, it surfaces and, and that's okay. God knows that's in me. Um, and he knows that I want to get past it. And sometimes I'm like, I want to get past this jealousy. I don't want to be angry with you. I don't want to do this right now. Help me through it. I know you've gotten me through it before. I love you. And I want to get past it. It's kind of like sometimes with my husband, I'm like, <laughs> I love you so much. I just, I just can't really stay in the kitchen with you anymore yeah, right now. Yeah. Right? Yeah, we, we, we've gotten through 25 years of this. Yes, so right. I need to get, <laughs> you so, know, it's just, you just have yeah. to get through it sometimes. Yeah, and, for sure. Yeah. And, and yes, and can, I'm, I'm not going anywhere, but I, I don't know how to do this right now either. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, let's get practical just for a moment because sure. what some of the listeners will, they don't have this in their life, right? They're not parenting a special needs child, or maybe they're not even really close to someone who is, but Give us some advice. At what what are things that people have done or we can do for you or for your child when we know someone is walking this path? What 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 are some things that are helpful? I think the best thing that people can do to begin with is to listen. Mm -hmm. And you don't not... need lots of advice from people mm -hmm. who actually haven't walked the road. Right, right. No, I'm laughing, but isn't that? Oh, I think we <laughs> say is. some things that aren't helpful when we don't know what to say. Right. Please go well, on. Yes, I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. and I think I, I I do it too. I mean, how often? I mean, I always think back to the story of Job and his friends, and how often do we want to be Job's friends, where we we will sit there for a while, but the first moment we have just to open go. our mouths, we're yeah. going to be like, well. I here's what we think. And we don't want to sit in those ashes with our, with people. And we don't want to sit and we want to rush the grief. We want to rush that sadness because we want to get to the other side of it. And I know there's, again, statistically speaking, there is really, it's very unlikely a cure will be found for my son in our lifetime. It will not happen. Very there's not been one for over 300 years and it won't be one. Um, it's just too difficult. Um, but to say, well, I just can't wait to see what miracles God's going to work in his life. There's going to be miracles, but a cure, maybe not like I, those aren't always helpful or, um, sometimes it's just listening. Um, we're exhausted. And it is a 24 hour a day, seven day a week, 365 day job. And being a caregiver is different than being a parent. And we still have the parent angst. We still have, and then we have the caregiver on top of it. We're still wives. All of these 
jobs are intermingled with being a caregiver and we're juggling. And so sometimes it's just sitting in that space with us or just listening and, and not taking on that role of Job's friends. Yes. I think, yes. um, I think, thank you so much for encouraging yeah. us with that because we can all do that and we can get better at yeah. it. We don't have to have any answers. We don't have to have medical degrees. We don't have to fix mm-hmm. it. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to fix you, but you know, we don't have to, right. you know, uh, we just, if we can just come alongside and say, your, your sadness or your situation is not too much mm-hmm. for me. And I will sit right here with you in it. Yeah. yeah. Right. And I, I think too, another, and more of a practical thing, um, is not to say, let me know when you need some help. I just do something. Yes. Mm-hmm. Even if it is, hey, I want to come over Wednesday and I just want to, could, can you teach me how to sit with your child for an hour? Mm-hmm. Just even if you just want to take a walk around your neighborhood, I want to spend some time with your child. I want to get to know your child. We are constantly fearful of overburdening other people. Um, we, my as, son, we, as the parent, we, as the parent, gotcha. yes. Mm-hmm. Um, because it is, especially if our children are medically complex and even if our children have invisible disabilities, there are some people with invisible disabilities, um, that, um, adopted or foster children who have behavioral or like reactive attachment disorders or um, fetal alcohol syndrome that have violent tendencies. Though a lot of them have been asked to leave the church because they are too violent for the church. I can't even begin to tell you how many parents that we have that have said we've been asked to leave the church after we have adopted children. So hmm. how, how you could help is I want to help you. So I want to, I want to help you. I want to get Teach to know me. your child. Teach, Teach me. me. Teach me how to help you. Yeah. yeah. Tell instead me of, how. Instead of yeah. call me. Yeah. Because there's such yeah. there's such a when you say, "Let me know if I can help you," you're putting the burden on you mm-hmm. to let right. me know how I can help. But if I if I enter your space and say, "Teach me how to help you," exactly. I think I f- I hear what you're saying. That's yeah. a completely different like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it might take you a hot minute to know how to use me, how to teach Mm -hmm. me, but I'm going to, I'm just going to keep showing up, um, until I, until I can figure out how I can serve you in this. That's really helpful, Sarah. I have, I have a a gentleman actually at our church when we were first diagnosed, they said, what can we do, um, to help? And we want, you know, they, they, they set us down and they said, what is the one thing that we can pray over you about? Like what, what's the first thing that we can pray over you about? And we said for us, we pr- pray over our marriage. That was the first thing that came up because over 85% of marriages sure. with Duchenne end in divorce. So we said, pray over our marriage. That was the first thing. And he said, okay. And, um, to this day, 11 years later, he will see me at church and he'll say, how are you doing? I'm like, fine. And he'll put his hand on my shoulders and he'll get right. He'll bend down and get in my face. He's like, fine. Doesn't cut it. Mm -hmm. I want you to say something real. And I will tell him, I'm like, it's a really hard week this week. Well, why? And he will, he'll drill down until I give him a very honest answer. And things like that make me feel very seen. Like he really wants to know. And I'll say, well, his medication was canceled. And this one medication is, you know, that's keeping his heart going. They're going to cancel it again. And if I have to pay out of pocket, it's like $40,000 a year. That's just insane. I can't do that. And so what are we going to do? It's either his heart stops or we move to Canada. Like, you know, it's like one of those things. And it's like, okay, so what, what, how do, what, what do I pray for? Yeah. And I will tell him. And then he'll ask me the next week. So have we heard any more about the medication? And he really, really wants to know. And I feel like I have a real champion on my side. It's not just a, it's just not something that he's arbitrarily throwing out there. And I think those are important too. Yeah. Yeah. To not just how are you and accept the fine, Mm -hmm. but if you're going to ask, if you're going to bother to ask, Mm -hmm. listen for the response and even encourage someone, because I think a lot of us who are struggling with something, we're used to just, I I tell my husband this sometimes, uh, because I've had a long journey of healing from my abuse. And I'm like, I just, I need somebody in my life sometimes who doesn't need me to be okay. 
Like it right. just, you know, it's like they ask you, how are you doing? And then you just, please tell me you're fine. Cause I don't, you know, like I'm supposed to ask, right. but I need you to be fine. And I'm like, right. I'm not always fine, but I know, I know when the question is asked, I know the answer is supposed to be, I'm doing great. Thank you. Like, yeah. I'm good. I'm so good. You know, you know and, yeah. yeah. And be the person. Can we be the person that s- sits right there for a moment and says, no, how are you really? What? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I yeah. want to know. Yeah. 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 Because like you said, you don't, you know, most, most people, or at least that our feeling is we, our lives make people on very uncomfortable. Yes. Um, a lot of people, especially parents with children are my son's age, especially when they were, he was younger. They don't want that mirror reflected and like, oh, that could happen to my son. I just so. don't want that to be possible that it's happened to, to my, yes, right. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and we don't want to make them uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And so you say fine. Yeah. And so for somebody that's like, I don't need fine. I need you. I need whatever shape you come in. I need whatever hot mess express. Yes. <laughs> You're going to come to me. Because <laughs> you look all cleaned up at church. Right. But I bet every moment right. this week hasn't been right. that way. Right. right. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I can't even begin yeah. to tell you how many times the tears have flowed. And he's like, sure. yeah. And, and that's what happens. And he knows tears are coming. Yeah. So, and that's okay with him. And I feel safe. Yeah. And I can't. And I think you probably understand of how rare that is to yes. feel safe with somebody who yes. says, how are you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I see what you're doing. I see mm-hmm. how hard it is. I want to know how you're doing because you're doing it. I see you're doing it, but how mm-hmm. are you? Mm-hmm. How is your soul today? Yeah. Right. Oh. Right. Sarah, before I let you go, this has been fantastic. I can't thank you enough for your time mm-hmm. of sharing. I just mm-hmm. wondered, is there... Uh, our verse this week is Second Corinthians four eight. We're hard pressed, but we're not crushed. We're not in despair. Uh, it doesn't have to be that one. Uh, is there a mm-hmm. verse or a passage of scripture that's just really one that you cling to? It's kind of a go to for you as you walk this journey. Well, I love that verse. I actually love that entire chapter. Um, that's one of my favorites. I think that one also, in conjunction with one of my favorite ones, is the story um, from Daniel of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Um, And yes, it, both of those remind me. The one from Daniel is Daniel three, three eighteen, And it is even if, yeah. And I always tell myself, and that's what, whenever I was on that, that the bathroom (laughs) or the, the closet floor um, is even if, you do not take this from me. I will still yeah. follow you. And that is what, that that's, that's really what I feel gets me through. Yeah. I um, love that story so much. I love I their too. boldness. Our God can save us from this and we sure hope he does. But even if he doesn't, right, even if right. he doesn't, we're not, we're right. not doing anything different. We're not doing it the way you say, because this is where we're standing and we'll take right. it. Come what may. Uh, yeah. And I have other people that, you know, I mean, like King Nebuchadnezzar and that, and that story said, and then what God will be able to rescue from you know, from my power. He's taunting them and saying, well, I'm going to throw you into this furnace and who's going to save you then. And, you know, they said, well, we don't have to defend ourselves against, you know, against this matter. And even if, you know, we're thrown into this blazing furnace, the God we serve will be able to deliver us from it. And, but even if he doesn't, we will never serve you. Mm-hmm. And I think it's the NLT version that says, but even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you. Mm-hmm. And that's what I always tell myself, even like I will tell myself, I want to make it clear to you, Sarah, <laughs> that even if he doesn't today, he will take it from you tomorrow. Like sometimes I even have to make it clear to myself that even if he doesn't today, mm-hmm. he will he's going to, he's going to fill your promise. Yeah. So, um, and, and I think that's the same with the second Corinthians four, eight, and we are hard pressed on every side it's coming at us. And it, it reminds me of that whack-a-mole game at that carnival. Yes. You know, it's like, and that's how sometimes life is. It's like, you would think that, you know, you don't, your cup doesn't fill when you have 
this one tragedy. It's like, they're not up there in heaven saying, Oh, she's done. You know, right. and she's, and she's had her full, and no, you know, she's, my card. She's, had an, she's had enough. Let's just <laughs> let her lay low for a while. It doesn't happen that way. It's like, it, sometimes you pick your head back up and there comes the hammer again. And that's just, unfortunately the way that life goes. But I think it's coming at you from all sides, but you're not crushed because mm. God won't allow that. Yeah. And you know, you're perplexed, you're confused, but there's not despair. And I think that only that can happen with God. That's the only way that that can happen. And again, even if everything happens, even if you are stuck in that whack-a-mole game, even if God's going to rescue you from that, he's still going to be there. Yeah. And I think that that's just beautiful. We know the end of the story. It's mm -hmm. what we remind. We already know the end of the story. And sometimes the getting there, it's there's a lot of there's a lot of hammers coming down sometimes. Right. But we right. already know we are secure in the end of the story. Yeah. Sarah, I cannot thank you enough for your work, your time, your message. Mm -hmm. There are so many options you have facing the with the road that you're on, and the fact that you not only are an example to your son, your family, but that you are using your story to serve other people and encourage us is just amazing to me. It is a miracle in my opinion. And so I think what you and your family are doing is, um, is definitely it's, it has such rich eternal value. So thank you so much. So Sarah can be found at sarahclimb.com or also at takeheartspecialmoms.com. The book that we've been talking about that Sarah is a part of is called The Other Side of Special. What a gorgeous cover. And her co-authors are Amy Brown and Carrie Holt. And the podcast is Take Heart Special Moms. Is there anywhere else you'd like to send the listeners today? They can also find Amy, my co-host at amyjbrown.com and then carry it, carrymholt.com. Okay. I will put all of that yeah. and other places that you can find and follow in the book and all that kind of good stuff in today's show notes. And one more time, Sarah, thank you so much for serving us today. Oh, thank you, Angie, for everything. Really appreciate what you do too. And thank you, friend, for listening. Until next time, peace. I would bet there is someone in your life who is dealing with caring for someone else with a long illness, special needs, addiction, or mental health concerns. Suffering is all around us, and we can be the people who sit with another to ease their suffering. Let's be that to someone today. And if it's you today, if your road is long and difficult, it is my most sincere prayer that you have a person like Sarah's friend at church who consistently asks how you're doing. And if you don't, pray. Pray for God to open doors to that supportive relationship and then keep your eyes open because I know He is and will do it. Here again, our verse this week from the NIV, it says, We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair. That's 2 Corinthians 4, 8. Thank you again, Sarah, for sharing pieces of your story today. I won't soon forget your willingness to yell your frustration at God and his gentle arms that held you as you did so. If that's not a miracle, I don't know what is. And if you haven't yet, I encourage you to listen to Monday's Take It In episode where I focus on the word crushed. Next week, our Take It In verse will be Proverbs 31.8 that encourages us to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. And my guest will be Christina Zorick. Christina is the daughter of Academy Award winner Olympia Dukakis. You might recognize that name. But in her own right, Christina is a documentarian, among many other things. And she'll be here to talk to us about her new film that sheds light on the darkness of human trafficking. If you haven't yet, I'd be so grateful if you would subscribe or follow the podcast on whatever directory you're using to listen. It only takes a second and it guarantees you'll see new episodes as soon as they drop. Thank you so much for listening. I pray wherever your day takes you, you are walking in the confident knowledge that you are a beloved, cherished child of God. Peace.